Shalom from Jerusalem. Thank you all for joining us this evening for a very um, meaningful lecture that I'm sure you will all learn about a lot while you listen. Tonight, our lecturer is Emmanuel Moskowitz, who has worked at Yad Vashem since 2013. She began working in the International School for Holocaust Studies as a tour guide and worked in the International Research Institute as a researcher on the transports to the extinction pro project, where she specifically researched the transports from France during the Holocaust. Since 2015, Emmanuel has worked in the archives and is responsible for archival acquisitions in Western and Southern Europe. Manuel is also a PhD candidate at the Tel Aviv University, and her research topic deals with the general chaplaincy of French Jews in France during the Second World War. Thank you so much for joining us again, and Emmanuel, I give you the Zoom. Thank you, thank you, Malki. Thank you all uh, for joining us. I'll just share my screen. Um, it's my honor to be among you tonight, uh, today, <laughs> afternoon, morning, or evening, depending where you're joining us from, uh, and to have the opportunity to present uh, to you this topic um, on the eve of the um, of the the day of the Valdiv Roundup, um, which occurred on the 16th of July, 1942. My topic today will deal specifically with the topic of family separation during the Holocaust by looking specifically at last letters written by deportees who were arrested during the Veldi Roundup. Um, so at the same time, I will, of course, bring to light uh, this Roundup and the family separation that ensued. I'd like to say just before starting that the letters that I will present in this um, lecture today are letters that are in Yad Vashem's archival collection of correspondence. Um, you can see an example here just on my screen. These letters have, for the most part, this collection has been digitized and a lot of the correspondence is now, the, the archival documentation is now available um, on Yad Vashem's website in the documents archives. Um, so I encourage all of you uh, afterwards to, to take a look at Yad Vashem's website and to see some of the archival material that's accessible to researchers um, and the general public, um, even from outside the, the site of Yad Vashem itself. And as we all know, uh, the pandemic has made it very difficult for many people to travel. So accessibility to archival material online um, is always well appreciated. Um, I'd just like to give a very brief historical background to put, the, to put things into context. Um, France was invaded by German forces in June, 1940. Uh, Germany, the Nazis conquered France, and a month later, the, an armistice was signed, uh, which in essence divided the country in two, and this is what we see here on the map. So the northern uh, zone, the area that's marked in orange here and on the map, uh, came under a German occup occupation, while the south of the country uh, was governed by a French collaborationist government headquartered in Vichy and led by Maréchal Philippe Pétain. The, for this specific uh, lecture today, the main geographical focus will be the northern occupied zone, um, since that's where the uh, infamous Valdiv roundup took place in Paris and its surrounding areas. The, the uh, Valdiv roundup, as I said, occurred on July 16th, 1942, um, and it's probably the most well-known roundup of um, when we talk about roundups in France during the Second World War. However, it wasn't the first. Um, during 1941, there were three uh, rather large arrests that took place in Paris. Um, the first of which, May 1941, where 3,747 Jews were arrested by the French police detained in Petitvier and the bonne la Ronde camps. These were men, essentially, arrested that day. In August 1941, uh, again, over a, a little over 4,000 Jews were arrested, and this time, and for the first time, a large number of uh, Jews of French citizen, citizenship were arrested. Um, if before then, the main, uh, in May 1941, the, main, the, the Jews arrested were mainly Jews of foreign nationality. And finally, in December 1941, uh, close to 800 Jews were also of French citizenship were arrested and detained in the Compiègne camp. 
Um, and the picture that you see here um, is uh, depicts the arrests of August 1941, where we see uh, the French police stopping and asking for papers and arresting uh, Jews in the streets of Paris. So these first three uh, large arrests that occurred in Paris in 1941, um, the Jews arrested would make up the first transports to leave uh, French territory, the first transport leaving in March 1942, um, and following transports in June uh, as in July as well. Uh, in July 1942, the Veldiv the Vel Roundup, what we, we refer to today as the Veldiv Roundup, occurred. Um, this roundup uh, has been the subject of several movies, books. Uh, some of you may be um, acquainted with Sarah's Key, for example, which is a book and then made into a motion picture, um, or La Rafle, uh, which in English translates to The Roundup, which is also a movie which depicts um, specifically the events of the Veldiv and also um, the deportations that, um, that followed. How did this... The Veldiv Roundup, how is it different than the first three that I, um, that I discussed uh, for the, the arrests in 1941? For the first time in July, uh, July 16th, 1942, uh, women and children are arrested in large number. The, documents that, the document we see in front of us here on the slide is um, a document from the central office of the Reich detailing um, the arrests of the 16th of July, 1942, um, where we have... First of all, the number, the total number of Jews arrested, which was larger, of course, than any of the other roundups of 1941, 12,884 Jews, uh, Jews of foreign nationality, many Polish refugees who had found refuge in France uh, during the interwar period. And as you can see, for the first time, women and children are arrested in large numbers. In fact, larger numbers than men. We have a total of 3,031 men arrested on the 16th of July, 1942, uh, we have 5,800 women and 4,051 children. One of the reasons why there were more children and, uh, and, and uh, women arrested during this roundup um, is the fact that the men, many who had heard rumors that an upcoming uh, roundup was to take place, had fled. Um, and they, because the arrests in 1941 had targeted only men um, and women and children were not affected by these measures, um, many felt that their families were safe. And so when the police came to arrest these families um, in, in, in Paris on the, the day of July 16th, 17th, um, often they found mothers and children left alone in the apartments while the, the fathers had, had left the house and they were taken. Following these arrests, as I said, a total of 12,884 Jews were arrested. Those Jews who were arrested with their children, so families, were sent to the Vélodrome d'Hiver. Um, and the Jews that were arrested as single Jews, of course, you know, they weren't all single Jews, but many had found refuge for their children before these mass arrests, or their children happened to not be home, uh, they were sent directly to the Drancy camp. And I will discuss a bit more uh, this difference um, in a minute. Um, the situation for those who were uh, sent to, sorry, I close the chat, to, um, to the Vélodrome d'Hiver, and for those of you who've seen the movies that I uh, presented earlier, La Raft or Sarah's Key, um, where these, this, this detainment in this, what was in essence a sporting stadium before the war, where thousands of Jews, children, um, adults, children together, uh, were meant to stay, you know, temporarily, and yet they stayed for up to four days um, before they were then transferred on to camps in, uh, in the region of Paris. And uh, I'd like to read a letter, uh, an anonymous letter. We have the name of the person who signed the letter, Maurice, but no additional information. Um, that was written from the Vélodrome d'Hiver on the 18th of July, 1942. I am writing to you, and I hope this letter will reach you. I hope you are aware of our new situation. Please know that we are all together. Do not worry about us. This is the third day that we are in the camp. The sanitary conditions are not the best, but with a lot of courage, it is supportable. Apparently tomorrow they will send us some women and children to the Loiret. There have been deaths among the children. There are many friends here. Impossible to describe the scenes. I am writing this letter as this is a chance to give you an update on us. Kisses, courage we have, see you soon. So this is a letter written to a father and brother 
by someone, Maurice, uh, who's detained in this Vélodrome d'Hiver towards the end of those four days um, and waiting to find out what will be his fate. Um, what I'd like to do now is share a short um, clip of some survivors of the Vélodrome d'Hiver arrest and of the time in the camp itself um, to hear from them on the conditions in the camp. So I will just... At six o'clock in the morning, they knocked on our door and there was a uniformed French policeman and a plainclothes person, which I don't know if he was French or German, I'm not sure. And they told us to get a few things together and to get some food for maybe two, three days, if we could, and to come with them. At that point, we were being arrested, in effect. Beatrice, my girlfriend, my school friend, and her mother, and me, we arrived at the fam fam famous or infamous Velodrome d'Hiver. And we came in there, and they showed us a corner where we were supposed to stuff some bag with straw to make our mattress, and then we could pull, go down wherever we wanted. And in between this big velodrome d'Hiver, they had this big stands where the soldiers were standing to look down on us. And we got in there and already there were thousands of people in that arena. And it was horrible. It was really a horrible sight. People laying down, sitting, crying and screaming. It was like a constant screaming throughout the three days, I remember. And I remember walking over to the area where the, the stadium, where they have the, uh, the race, and, and every now and then there would be something flying out over the balconies and landing. And I didn't realize it at the time, but there were people killing each other themselves. They were committing suicide. They were jumping to their death. After the first day or so, uh, really didn't have any food, didn't have uh, any milk for their children. Um, uh, the bathrooms weren't working. I remember waiting online to go to the bathroom and uh, I never got to that bathroom. I don't remember what I did. Uh, um, I, I think I've blocked out a lot of what I saw there. Uh. I think uh, hearing it from the voices of the survivors themselves is uh, just a much more real way to illustrate what, what was there when for them, even themselves, it's hard to describe as we see in the, in the letters and the testimonials. Um, but you can imagine, uh, as I said, the families were moved to the Vedotron Zidar. So we're talking about children, infants, babies um, with their parents, sometimes only with their mothers. As I said, some of the, the fathers uh, were not arrested that day as they had managed to escape. And they stayed there for four days, after which they were transferred to two camps, Bon Maroland and Petit, and Petit Vier, um, in the Loire. And I will come back to that group um, a little bit later in the lecture. What I'd like to do now is um, share some stories and some last letters of those single Jews that were arrested during the Valdiv uh, roundup and sent straight to the Grancy camp. And again, when I say single Jews, most of them did have children, um, only that their children were away the day, the, the day of the arrests because they had managed to find them refuge. Some had sent them to the south of France, some had sent them with family members, um, some of the children happened to be out. Um, and I'd like to share some of these uh, stories with you today and then come back to the second group a little bit later in the lecture. Uh, the first family um, I'd like to present, uh, the Factor family, Aaron and Ite Factor, uh, were Polish immigrants who were married in Paris. Um, what we see here on the screen are uh, their wedding certificate, their ketuba. Uh, we can see written in French and also in Hebrew. They were, as I said, Polish uh, refugees who uh, were married in Paris, had two children, French citizens, Maurice and Jacques. And Aaron and Ite were among those Jews arrested uh, on July 16, 1942. 
their children uh, were with their grandparents in the south of France and thus avoided these, uh, this roundup. They were able to send two letters before their deportation, uh, July 21st, 1942. Um, each sent a letter to their children. And I'd like to share these letters uh, with you today. The first was written by um, Aaron Factor to both his sons. Uh, he writes, my dear children, I am leaving tomorrow and so is mom. We are in good health. My dear Maurice, take good care of your brother Jacques. Listen carefully to advice, the advice that people give you. Don't leave the house one without the other. I hope you are well. Do the best you can because your parents are not here. Try to become men and think of us. Give the grandparents a big hug for us, a big hello to the whole house. Your father who sends you a big kiss, I take you with me in my heart. Ite Factor, their mother, also writes a last letter right before her deportation. They were both deported on the 21st of July, 1942 to Auschwitz. She writes, my dearest children, I am writing to you from the Nancy camp where we are preparing to leave to an unknown destination. My dearest little ones, have courage and hope that perhaps the future will bring us together again. Be kind among yourselves and be united in adversity. We will come to look after you, but never agree to leave home. My dear Maurice, you are the head of the family. Be brave and make sure you are not too unhappy. Attend to all the people you know. Write to the commander of the Drancy camp to receive a sum of 2,500 francs, which you are entitled to receive. Tell grandfather and grandmother not to despair and to have courage. I embrace you, my dear children, with all my heart. These two letters were the last letters written by um, uh, Aaron and Ite Factor. This was right before they were uh, boarded onto cattle cars and deported to Auschwitz on July 21st, 1942, uh, from where they did not return. I think both these letters show some similar themes. First, this, you know, were, of course, worrying for their children, asking the older son, Maurice, to take over as head of the family and make sure that he keeps strong. And this symbol of courage that they try to pass on to their children, that they're okay, that they're courageous. Another interesting element, specifically in a letter written by Ite Factor, is this question of, you know, writing to the commander of the Drancy camp to ask for this money that she had left behind. And I think that also illustrates the beginning of the deportations uh, the mass deportations from France in July 1942, where very little was known as to the intent. And um, I don't think, you know, E.T. Factor could have envisioned that children would also be included in transports just a month later. And I, I will come back to that. The next um, family I'd like to present, the Trauger family. Uh, the following letter was written by Charlotte Trauger uh, to her son. And I'll just give a little bit of background on Charlotte. She uh, was an immigrant from Budapest. She came to Paris with her mother, uh, her sister. And she, at the young age of 18, she gave birth to a child. The father was unknown and she raised this child, Maurice, alone with the help of her, her mother, uh, her, her parents and her sister. And uh, she also had a younger brother, Benjamin, who was about the same age as her, as her son. And in July, at the beginning of July, 1942, uh, she sent her son Maurice to the south of France to a camp for sick children. It's not clear in the documentation uh, what kind of illness he had, but he had some sort of illness that needed treatment. So he was sent to this, this camp uh, for treatment. And she writes him a series of letters uh, before her arrest in July, 1942. And I'd like to share with you some of these, these letters. The first written July 9th, uh, 1942. And she writes, my dear little one, I signed you up for fishing. You will be leaving on August 14th with a girl from the air area. So don't have to worry about that anymore. I have paid and Mr. The Abbot told me that he's keeping your place for you. I think you're still enjoying yourself. You are well behaved and above all, you are taking care of yourself seriously. Did you ask about your sick nose? I dare to think so, and I hope in your next letter you will keep me informed of everything. I give you a tender kiss, your mother. A week later, she writes another letter to her son. She writes, dear little one, and this is again two days before her arrest, July 14th, 1942. I just received your card. Yes, I am surprised that you have not received anything from me. Yet I write to you very often. Don't worry, in Paris, everything is fine. 
You should write to Mr. Ruchla. I have already asked you to contact him. You know how kind he was to you. I come back to your card, which makes me ashamed to receive filled with spelling mistakes. I would like you to write to me and correct your mistakes. When I think that I made you take French lessons and you haven't made any progress, I'm very sorry that you don't think before writing. I give you an affectionate kiss, mummy. I share these, these letters with you before getting to her, her last letters because I think first it's important to understand the relationship, the mother-child relationship, which says a lot. This um, emphasis for her on her son to learn the French language um, and speak French um, is really a way for her to see her son have all the advantages possible um, as any French citizen would. Um, of course, she couldn't have imagined that this would be the last letter she wrote to her son. Uh, two days later, on July 16th, 1942, uh, she was arrested. Charlotte Trauger was arrested together with her mother, Régine, uh, and her sister, Yolande, who was married to a French non-Jew, had managed to escape uh, this arrest because of her, her marriage with this, um, with this Catholic French and her uh, younger brother, Benjamin, had fled during the time of the arrests. So he was also, um, he, uh, he was also safe during that roundup of the 16th of July, 1942. Charlotte writes uh, last letters, the first of which she writes to her sister Yolande uh, right before her deportation on July 24th, 1942. Dear Yolande, as you can see, I I'm in a camp and I'm leaving with mother to an unknown destination. Yolande, despite, despite the fact that I have a French child, I have to leave him in France. I entrust you with Maurice. Tell him the situation I find myself in. I am brave and I hope to come back. Maurice is everything to me. Do not abandon him and do not leave him. Give my love to my child, Charlotte. She writes another letter, a second letter to her younger brother, uh, Benjamin. You can see him in the picture depicted here. Dear Benjamin, I am sending you this card to tell you that mommy and I are leaving for an unknown destination. I am brave and hope you will see, we will see each other soon. Be careful at home. Yolande will watch over everything. Don't give Fernand anything. We are leaving with a kiss and see you soon, mom and Charlotte. We don't have a letter um, written to Maurice. Um, she may not have had time. She may not have had the capability to write to her son. Uh, I mean, of course, these are you know questions we don't have the answers to. Um, the two letters she did write were to uh, Benjamin and to Yolande. Um, and of course, to Yolande, it was a plea for her to take care of her son. Charlotte Trauger was deported to Auschwitz um, July 24th, 1942. So was her mother, Régine. And Benjamin Trauger, uh, while he had escaped these roundups of July 1942, um, he was arrested at the end of December uh, and deported February 23rd um, to Auschwitz and also uh, perished there. Maurice did survive. He was taken care of by Yolande, uh, who took her, him under her wing for the rest of the war and he, he survived the war. I'd like to come back uh, to those families that were detained in the, in the Val d'Ive um, and afterwards sent to the two camps in the Loiret, so Bonnard-Hollande and Petitvier. Um, in the following book, Sans oublier les enfants, so to not forget the children, uh, there are a few testimonies um, that describe the, the family, the separation of, uh, of mothers, fathers, and their children right before the deportation. So when the, these families were brought together to these camps in the Loire, Petit Vien, Vaud de la Rolande, um, the French authorities were waiting uh, for the authorization from, uh, from, from the Nazi authorities to deport families together. That's to say to deport children under the age of 16. They preferred that uh, mainly uh, for reasons of public opinion, um, that it would look bad to send, to separate families. Um, by the end of the July, they had not yet received authorization to deport children under the age of 16, and yet three transports a week uh, were to leave France. So it was decided to take the adults that were in these camps, Bonnard-Hollande and Petitvier, and deport them starting at the end of July, 1942. And you can only imagine the scenes um, that followed. 
and Joanne Whiteham was uh, in the Petit Vieux camp right prior to the deportation of the 31st of July, uh, 1942, where the parents were taken, uh, where the children were taken from their parents and the parents were boarded onto two cattle cars and deported. So I'd like to just read his, his testimony quoted in this book. It was the most terrible transport we have ever experienced. They took all the men, the women who were without children, boys aged 14 and 15 left with their fathers. Others stayed, mothers were taken from the children and put into the convoy. Two more of these and children aged two to 13 will be all alone here. There are between 1,800 and 2,000 of them. No family has been left whole. What uh, Joanne's Whiteham describes here is essentially exactly what happened. After that deportation of July 31st, 1942, and two others at the beginning of August, 1942, thousands of children were left alone in the Petit Vieux and Bonaranon camp with several social workers to take care of them, uh, but no parents in sight. One of these children who was among the older in the group, uh, Pierre Volkovich was able to write a letter uh, from the camp, and he also describes the deportation or mentions the deportation of his mother on the 31st of July. Uh, he writes to the concierge of his old apartment building in Paris asking for help. Dear Madame Copolade, I am still at the Petit Vieux camp. My mother, who was at the camp with me, left a few days ago. We don't know where. Life is terrible. Since the Ville d'Hiver, where we stayed five days without food and almost no air, we have been locked up in Petit Vieux. There have been several departures and we still don't know where. At the moment, I'm starving. We are sleeping on straw and the lice and fleas are eating us. We have the right to receive parcels. I am all alone and without help in the camp. Please send me a parcel, dear lady. If I ever go somewhere else, I will let you know as soon as I can. I give you a warm hug to you, dear lady, to your husband, your children, always thinking of you. And Pierre uh, Volkovich, while not deported with his mother, um, was deported along with the other children just a few weeks later, starting mid-August. Um, starting at the middle, middle of August 1942, um, the authorization came to deport children under the age of 16. Um, at this point, their parents had already been deported. The children were taken from bonne petit vieux to the Drancy camp, and together with adults already in the camp or Jews who had been deported from the unoccupied zone, transports were mixed together to make the impression that families were being deported together, when in essence there were no, no, no biological relation between the children and those adults on those um, cattle cars to Auschwitz. The last uh, family that I'd like to present, um, the Frankel family, Esther, Nissam, and Richard Frankel, um, Esther and Richard, you can see here on the picture, mother and child. Uh, Richard was about two years old um, in the picture. And Nissan Frankel is the third from the left here on the top row. Nissan Frankel had joined, he, they're Polish immigrants as well. He had joined the Foreign Legion um, and so was in the French Armed Forces for 39, 1940. And he was among those first Jews arrested in May 1941 and detained in bonne camp. So in essence, from 1939 on, Esther had very little contact with her husband between him being in the, force, in the armed forces and then his detainment in May 1941 in the bonne camp. Um, Esther wrote a letter to her husband at the end of May 1941, so just a few weeks after um, his arrest. And while this letter is a bit long, uh, I couldn't really cut it short. I think the the it's really a, a fascinating love letter uh, and a letter of a, a wife who longs to to see her husband after so many years. And her um, it also illustrates a lot of her fears for her son, but her will to keep her wish to keep him close to her. So she writes, "My dearest Frank, this is the third year that I must spend the most beautiful month May far away from you. Despite it all, my morale remains high." There is no other choice. This morning I had to get up early and lazy one that I am, I stayed in bed with open eyes and recalled memories. You were so close to me in my imagination and listened to the stories of my moments of sadness and happiness. It was no dream, no delusion, but a moment of happiness and pleasure. 
Your Richard, believe me, is a wonderful boy, full of life. He is lively, brimming over with vitality that everyone marvels at him. The plan of sending him to the country has run into some difficulties at the present, nor do I want to send him to a nanny. Not far from Paris, there is a kindergarten for children under the age of two, but I don't want to send him there either. It seems he will stay with me in Paris. I am enclosing a picture of myself, but I ask that you do not show it to anyone. I look more like a tired kindergarten teacher and my posture is tasteless. But I'm sending you this picture anyway, because you asked so persistently. Have no fear, in reality, I look much better and your first kiss will immediately improve my appearance. There is only one thing which interests me, to be with you forever. All of the trivial problems will vanish quickly as though they had never existed. Is that not so? In these times when letters are such a rare commodity, I should have written more, but my thoughts keep turning back to the same topics as though caught in an accursed cycle. I kiss you fiercely, my beloved, and see you very soon. Again, this was a letter written in May, 1941. In June, um, 1942, on, for Richard's second birthday, um, his son, Nissan Frankel carved in these letter openers that you can see, um, a dedication to his son. First, you can see the illustration of the camp. <clears throat> it's signed Bon La Hollande, the 21st of June, 1942. To my dear little Richard for your second birthday, June 21st, 1942, Bon La Hollande. This was, of course, the last gift Richard would receive. On July um, 16th, 1942, uh, Richard and Esther Franco were arrested in their apartment, taken to the Vélodrome d'Hiver, and uh, they were among the, the Jews transferred to the Bonnard camp, to the, sorry, Petit camp. Esther was one of these mothers that had to leave her child in Petit um, She was deported at the beginning of August, 1942. And she, she was able to write a letter in the, the cattle car on her way to Auschwitz um, before passing the border. Uh, she, she threw the letter out of the train and it was picked up by a railway worker. Um, and I will read her letter to you. My dear family, I am on the train. I do not know what has become of my Richard. He is still in Petit Vier. Save my child, my innocent baby. He must be crying horribly. Our suffering is nothing. Save my Richard, my little darling. I can't write. My heart, my Richard, my soul are far away and no one is protecting my two-year-old boy. To die quickly, oh my child, give me my Richard. Esther. This is written by a woman who has just experienced probably the most tragic um, event of separation of her child, thrown into a cattle car and deported, she doesn't know obviously where, in terrible conditions. And uh, she, the only thing she can think about is the same situation occurring to, to, to her son who was left behind. Richard Frankel was uh, deported on the 11th of the 10th of September, 1942. He appears here on the deportation list, the sixth. We can see his date of birth, 1940. Um, and he was among those children that were deported alone uh, weeks, weeks after their parents uh, had been deported. We can see here the page of testimony that was written for Richard Franco. I'd like to, and I'm moving towards the end, uh, just end with uh, testimony from Georges Wellers, who was detained in the Drancy camp and who witnessed the arrival of the children and their preparation for their deportation to Auschwitz. And during the Nuremberg trial, he gives a testimony on this, uh, on this event. There were many infants, two, three, four years old, who did not even know what their names were. When trying to identify them, we sometimes ask a sister, an older brother. Sometimes we simply asked other children if they knew them in order to find out what they were called. Then in the camp, we made little wooden discs. And on these discs, the name was inscribed, which had been established in this way, obviously without any certainty that the name was correct. And the discs were then attached with a string to the neck of each child. Unfortunately, some while afterwards, we found boys with discs carrying girls' names and girls with discs belonging to boys. The children amused themselves with these discs and swapped them. When asked by the judge if the children had left the camp easily, 
Uh, Wellers responds, no, most of the time, this too was a terrible operation. They were woken up early at five o'clock in the morning. They were given coffee. They had been woken up early and they were in a bad mood. So the women volunteer tried through persuasion to get the older children to come down first. But several times it happened that the children began to cry and struggle. It was impossible to bring them down into the courtyard of the camp. And so policemen had to go into the rooms and take into their arms the children who were struggling and screaming. 11,400 children were deported from France. Most, as I just um, explained, were deported without their, their parents by their side. Um, this book, which was done in collaboration with Serge Klausfeld and also the municipality of Paris, uh, tries to bring to life these, the, the, the lives of these children, the biographies of these children, wherever we had documentation um, possible and pictures. Um, and you can see some of the examples here. Um, of course, these children were you know, young victims. Many, like uh, Richard Frankel, were, you know, had lived two years. The only experience that they had was this experience of the war, those born 1939, 1940. Um, and their death is tragic, um, more so in the fact that they didn't have that support um, of a father, a mother by their side, um, during those, those most difficult experiences of deportation and of the unknown. Um, so I will end here and I'd be happy to answer any questions and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was just heart-wrenching, but beautiful. And um, I don't have any questions yet on the chat, so I think I will start by asking you how um, all these letters and testimonies were gathered um, after such a difficult time. Yeah, thank you, Malki. It's a good question. First of all, the letters are, are um, letters written during the, the time of the events themselves. Um, Yad Vashem has a, a program called Collecting the Fragments, um, where we ask um, survivors, more so today, I would say descendants of survivors, um, to donate material to Yad Vashem, archival material, things that they find um, you know, in the attics of their homes. And you can see uh, the amazing material that, that this program has brought to Yad Vashem. And as I said, all these letters have been digitized and are now fully accessible to the public um, on the Yad Vashem website. So the letters themselves are letters that were written um, during the, the events themselves. The testimonies, um, yeah, the, the, it was not always easy to find testimonies in English. So the, the few survivors that were coupled in that first video that I showed happened to be survivors that afterwards settled in, in the States. Um, and so some people had discussed the events many, many years later. Um, and of course, the testimony from the Nuremberg trial, which I presented at the end of George Weller's, is rather recent, uh, recent after the events, um, where you know, he was able to describe with rel relatively soon after um, that occurred. And I can note that George Weller's was actually himself deported to Auschwitz and survived um, as well. And we do have some questions now. Um, people would like to know if you have any idea if um, and how many children survived these roundups. Oh, that's a very hard statistic uh, to, to get to how many children survived the roundups because um, it would be hard to calculate. We can tell you how many, we have the censuses of Jewish population in France. So I can tell you there were before the war 330,000 Jews um, in France, um, about close to half lived in Paris, uh, and 76,000 were deported. Um, so for children specifically, I don't have that data, but that's a general overview of the total population. And did, um, at what point did they realize they were being deported to a, a camp like Auschwitz? Yeah, so the, the deportations that I'm describing, uh, July 1942, are really the first, as I said, the, the first mass deportations from Paris occurred starting in July 1942. So at this point, there was less of an awareness. We start to see the later deportations, code words um, in letters um, regarding 
what was Auschwitz. And then we know, I mean, Auschwitz, they didn't have the word for, but a camp, you know, in, in, in the East. And so the, the documentation, I would say after later in 1942-43 has a bit more information on this, but specifically in the summer 1942, um, the information was very little on, on where uh, many assumed they were, or they were told they were going to the East to work. And this is why we're not sending the children, but capable adults, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, um, well, someone asked about the French police. What was their role in uh, deportations? That's a good question. Um, in July, beginning of July, 1942, there was an, an agreement between uh, Bousquet and Cal Aubel, so the German and French authorities, uh, where it was decided that the French police would um, assist in this mass roundup of July 1942 um, and would, in exchange, have certain autonomy um, to deal with its own affairs, even in the occupied zone. Um, and so the French police was involved in the arrests um, and most of even the survivors that we heard uh, when describing the arrests um, referred to the French police coming to their door. Um, so there was an involvement of the French police on that end. Wow. And we're talking about something that happened in July. Uh, we're in July now, and uh, many people wrote and felt um, how, how sad and uh, heartbreaking uh, such a thing was to think of families separated the way they were. And the, um, the testimonies that you brought, the letters you brought really, I think, brought us all. And we see in the chat to have feelings of, uh, of sadness and uh, feeling that these people suffered such a tragic end. And um, the, um, the other thing, we had a few people in the chat that had relatives that were actually either in the roundups or survived the roundups or survived the camps. And um, I think that's very meaningful for us as well that we came together as a group to hear uh, the immense knowledge you have and shared with us and also be able to share some of uh, our own families and what they had to do with such a tragic time in France for the Jewish people. So um, thank, you. If, uh, thank you so much. Uh, your knowledge is just a, uh, a springboard to, to know more and want to know more. So we thank you so much. It, uh, it truly is a special thing for all of us this evening to have joined with you. Um, and um, I think we will say good evening if there is no other questions. And from Israel, wherever you are, as you said at the beginning, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to see you at many more Yad Vashem lectures in the future. Good evening. Thank you, thank you.